It's nice to, to see everyone. Like he said, I am the first speaker today, so that means I get to set the tone for, this, for the whole thing. It also means someone made a very awful mistake at some point in planning this. So I'm going to make some jokes, and they're all going to be really bad, and I expect you to laugh at them anyway. If you don't, I'm going to be very disappointed in all of you. Um, today, well, before I get going, I do want to thank all of you for just being here. Without you, this wouldn't really be much of a show. It'd just be a bunch of guys sitting around talking to each other, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it's just not really an event. But I want to talk to you today about gratitude in business communication, which is something that is really important to a lot of us because we all need to network, we need to get into our professional lives because right now we're college students. If you're anything like me, you have no idea what's going on. There was a, a study done, really more of a survey, I suppose, by Peter Harris, who works for a job search site called Workopolis. And he wanted to know why employers didn't hire qualified candidates. He found quite a few things, actually. I'm only going to focus on the first three. The first one is that people had awful social media presences. And I can't really give you a whole lot of advice because it's just don't be stupid. Like, don't post, like, pictures of yourself doing drugs or drinking a lot on Facebook. No one needs to see that. Like, keep that on your phone to show your friends. No one else needs to know. Like, just don't post anything that your grandma wouldn't want to see. So maybe that's not helpful advice. But number two is they didn't dress appropriately. As I'm sure you can see, I also don't dress appropriately. Like, this was a formal speech, and I came here against the advice of the people running this thing, <laughs> wearing this. And the reason is, even though it's 90% stupid, it's also 60% brave and like 4% like sexy. <laughs> so I've had some, some varying degrees of success wearing things like this. All right, so the first two advice or sets of advice was just really bad. Don't follow any of that. But I do have something for the third one, and I think could be useful for everyone here. The third one was that candidates walked in with a bad attitude or they seemed uninterested in the work. And that seems just ridiculous to me. Like, why would you dress nice, like go out and delete all your beer pong pics from Facebook, set up the interview, go to the interview, and just you know, show up for the job, and then not want it? It just doesn't make any sense to me. And I've actually had a lot of experience with this because I'm very nervous. In fact, I'm very nervous right now, if you couldn't tell. Like, it's, it's great, you all look like ants, but it's just large, intimidating ants. <laughs> so, what is the problem here? Is it a lack of motivation, or just what is it? Well, like I said, it's a lack of communication. So, let me back up a little bit and tell you about myself in regards to the student organizations here on campus. I actually hold leadership positions on several of them one of which is the Performing Arts Club, where I'm the treasurer, which means I, I have to help deal with like, setting up the events and things, setting up the plays. I also have to go around and beg people for money, which is really hard when you have nothing to offer them in return. Just give us money and we'll do a thing. <laughs> Great. Another leadership position is I am the president, well, future, hopefully, president, of the Society for Collegiate Leadership and Achievement, which is a online honor society that gives resources for like pr improving your professional identity, I guess, like financial situation, just gives you advice, a lot of videos and things. But this means that I have to talk to my boss, who actually lives in Washington, DC. So I never see him, I probably never will. And that's probably a good thing, he'd see my Hawaiian shirt. But I do have to contact him via like, phone and email and things, so I have to be a professional there. And here's a little bit of shameless promotion because they happen to be here tonight. Another leadership position I hold is with the Brain Trust. And what we do is we want to bring ideas to action. And that involves 
basically people coming to us with ideas, with thoughts, things that they, like, they think will improve the campus or just the world, or their pocket, I guess, make them money. And what we do is we help them get to the people they need to get to, get them to places they need to be so they can grow their idea. And that requires a lot of resources. And a job that I kind of took upon myself, and they since invented a title for it, was I go out and I find these resources before we know we need them. That means I talk to everybody. I have to talk to people on campus like deans, the presidents of organizations, just all kinds of just random people here on campus. Outside of the campus, I talk to some very interesting people as well. I've talked to lawyers, I've talked to judges, I talk to politicians, to CEOs. One time I even talked to the Grand Master of a Freemason Lodge here in Indy. That was an interesting event. Uh, we ordered pizza and we later went ghost hunting. It was really weird. But I talked to all these people, and before I can go and just meet with them, because you can't just walk in a place and say, hey, talk to me, I have to email them. And I've taken professional writing classes before, and they tell you things like, keep your emails short, and, you know, put your main point like right at the beginning so they don't lose interest. But they didn't prepare me for the hardest challenge I had when I first started, and that was what to close the email with. And that's probably something that's really dumb for a lot of people, but I spent like an hour and a half sitting here thinking of two word phrases to end my, my email. And at first I thought, sincerely, except that sounded just too sincere. You know what I mean? Like I wanted them to understand that I believed in my message, but I didn't believe in it that much. So I thought about maybe thank you. But that seemed too formal, because that doesn't really match my personality. Like, just thank you is just too cold. It doesn't really mean anything either. Like, thank you for what? It doesn't matter. Then I thought maybe thanks. You know, it makes it more informal. But maybe a little too informal, and it still has that problem where it doesn't mean anything. And then there's best. And I hate best. <laughs> like, it's just, it doesn't, oh my gosh. When I see best, I think, best what? Best. Best wishes, best, I don't know, best pig at the state fair. It doesn't mean anything. It's empty. So that's, that was out. And no offense if you use that. You're just a horrible person. <laughs> so I finally decided on one that I really liked. And that was thanks again. And the little thanks was the informal thanks that I liked. But the again just added a little meaning to it. I don't know, I don't know why. I can't really explain it. It just it clicked for me. I liked that. And so I decided that I would use thanks again for every email I ever sent because I didn't want to have to sit there and think about it for half an hour every time. But that gave me some issues because thanks again implies that you thanked them for something in the email. And so I had to sit there and think about why I appreciate these people. So I would say, thank you for meeting with me. Thank you for giving me advice. If I couldn't think of anything else, I'd say thank you for your time, because you know, they are spending time to read my email, which is something, I guess. And I found that this had some interesting effects, because it started to become a habit. And the more and more I practiced saying thank you for things, the easier it got to figure out what to say thank you for. And this started to spread from more than just emails and into like my actual meetings with these people, because I couldn't just email them. Most people wanted to speak to me for reasons I don't fully understand sometimes, but they wanted me to come in and talk. And I found myself getting more relaxed with these people. The more grateful I was to them, the kinder I was, the, the easier it was to speak to them, and it, the easier it was for them to speak to me. And it really had this weird humanizing effect on people. Because like I said, I was talking to CEOs and like lawyers and things, people who make more money in a year than I probably ever will in my life. And it just got easier. Like these people were just people. They were sometimes became friends. Uh, there's someone here who is a CEO. He, well, I don't know if he's a CEO, but he started his own, his own business. And he's going to talk about that later. But he's the nicest guy. I've talked to him, I don't know, five or six times now, and he's super nice. So it really does get a lot easier. I found that this habit started to become a mindset. 
And it just really improved the way that I talked to people. And it improved the, the what would be the, a good word? It improved our relations. It improved what I got from them, what they got from me. And it just made it all so much nicer, a bundle of, I don't know, usefulness. That's not a very good word, but it's the best I had. And then the more I started talking to these people, the more I started to use this, the more this became a mindset, the more the mindset started to become a philosophy. Because I didn't just, like, I wasn't just thankful for the things that people were doing for me in business, you know, giving me money, things like that. I also found myself being more just appreciative of the things around me. I started enjoying my personal life a little better. And this means that like when I go and talk to people that I don't necessarily care to talk to, it was just easier. It was more stress-free. One example from my life is my fiance's parents. They like to invite me over for a board game night every once in a while. You know, come have dinner, play Uno, and I dread it. I hate it. It's the dumbest thing. Like I just sit there and. For weeks, I put it off. They'll call me and say, hey, what are you doing? I say, oh, I'm busy for the next four months. Call me back later. <laughs> and it's awful. It's stressful. And I dread it so much. But when I go and I do just have dinner, do the board game stuff, I have a lot of fun. Like Her parents are awesome. Her mom's a great cook. Her dad's funny. Her brother's kind of a douche, but he's OK. And it's just, it's a good time. And I found that if I could just appreciate that a little more, and go and just do it, and just go and stop dreading it and putting it off, I might stress out about it a little bit, but I go and I have fun, and I spend more time having fun than I spend being stressed out. And that had a major effect on me, and it would have a major effect on all of you, I'm sure. For instance, something that's maybe a little more relatable, is Thanksgiving. And it's right in the title, and most people still don't get it. Like, it's the first thing they tell you in fifth grade, is Thanksgiving is for giving thanks. So what we do instead is we get stressed out about making food, talking to people we don't usually talk to, just family that we hate. Just getting together in general is a stressful thing. Maybe Uncle Tommy is just, just smells really bad. But if we could focus on the things we enjoy, like maybe Uncle Tommy also is really funny. If we focus on that and have him tell jokes, be friendly to him, maybe the smell won't seem as bad later on. You know, maybe, maybe Grandpa is really racist, but <laughs> maybe he's not being racist in public? I don't know. That's not, a great, that's not a great one. But the point is, if you just pay attention and you find things to be thankful for, you will enjoy these things so much more. You'll have so much less stress. So I told you a lot of stuff, and mostly about me because I'm narcissistic. But hopefully, you know, you can kind of see where that might be helpful. So what can you do? Obviously, the whole thanks again email thing, I mean, that, that, do that, I guess. But a lot of people don't send as many emails as I send, because I'll send like 15 emails a day, five of which are to people I've never met before. Most people don't do that. So it probably wouldn't be super helpful. But what you should do maybe instead is something that I am blatantly stealing from a TED talk that I saw a few years ago. It's called Try Something New for 30 Days by Matt Cutts, I believe. And his idea was the 30-day challenge. And what you do is for 30 days, you do something or don't do something, depending on the situation, for every, every day for 30 days. And eventually, that thing will become a habit. At the end of the month, you'll have a new habit that you can exploit, I guess. And I tried this to get over my um, crippling Dr. Pepper addiction when I was younger. So every day for 30 days, I would avoid Dr. Pepper, and I would drink water. And at the end, I didn't really crave Dr. Pepper anymore. It wasn't something I really went to. Of course, I eventually did fall back off the wagon because Dr. Pepper has 23 flavors and I enjoy all of them. <laughs> but the point is, you can use this to your advantage in this situation. And I challenge you that for 30 days, start March 1st, every time you have a, a conversation with someone you don't normally talk to, and don't do it to people you talk to all the time because it would just get really annoying, but whenever you have a conversation with someone you don't normally talk to, Thank them for something. 
So if you go to your professor and ask them about a test question, thank you, like say thank you for meeting with me. Or if someone, like this is a weird example, but if someone asks you for a pencil, I mean, you still find a reason to thank them. Say thank you for asking so nicely. I don't, I don't know, just find something every time. If you call your mom, you don't talk to her very often, say thank you for helping me survive past 10. <laughs> Just find something. And at the end of those 30 days, you will find showing gratitude, being friendly towards people, is no longer a chore or something you have to think about. It's just a habit. And you'll want to continue that. It won't be a Dr. Pepper situation. You will want to continue to be happy with people. And it'll slowly, surely, become a mindset and go on to a philosophy. And you'll improve all of your interactions. So I challenge you all to do this, and hopefully you've learned something today with this, speak, or with this speech. If you haven't, then that's on you, I guess. Um, but hopefully you go out and you make better interactions, have better interactions. So this is my speech, and I hope you learned something. And as always, thanks again. <laughs>